Since the dawn of time, humans have been predators as well as prey. Our humble beginnings were plagued by carnivores of all kinds. But as technology and culture advanced, we became better suited to fighting off such beasts. Sticks got tipped with stones, and new technology like the atlatl and the bow revolutionized our hunting and defensive abilities. Towards the end of the Stone Age, many were giving up hunter-gatherer lifestyles and took up agriculture instead. This limited our encounters with predators as well as shrunk their habitat. Predation in turn became much less common, but still ever-present. Today we will be talking about our interactions with predators during historical times. This is a sequel to the last video about the predators of prehistory. This video will be similar to the last one, but a little different. It will cover both specific examples of predation and our other interactions with carnivores such as hunting, capture, and use at the Roman games. But before the video starts, we have an advertisement. What's that? Oh, it's our sponsor, Bespoke Post. Bespoke Post is a monthly membership club delivering awesome boxes of top shelf goods from under the radar brands. It's free to join and you can skip a month or cancel any time. Every month they introduce their members to cool new products. Outdoor gear, barware, home and kitchen goods, clothing, and more. Every box has around $70 worth of goods inside, but costs you only a fraction of the value. Once you sign up, you'll get a box assigned to you. Before it's shipped, you'll get a preview of what comes inside to decide if you want to keep it or swap it for a different box or to skip the month entirely for no charge. You only pay for what you want. I got the Split and Forge boxes. Both of these boxes are great if you like the outdoors and making things. I used both of these products to create a Stone Age knife relatively similar to Utsi's knife. The tools both work great and will certainly be part of my camping and crafting equipment from now on. To get 20% off your first box, click the link in the description and enter NORTH20 at checkout or go to bespokepost.com NORTH20. Huge thanks to Bespoke for sponsoring the channel, and now let's get back to the video. The first example we will be looking at is from the largest single work to have survived the Roman Empire. That would be Naturalis Historia, published in 77 AD by Pliny the Elder. In this comprehensive discussion of the natural world, we can get a glimpse into how people of the Roman Empire viewed nature. In the eighth book, Pliny describes lions in detail. He is fascinated by their retracting claws and peculiar mating habits. Soon after, he writes a fascinating passage about predation. That they are very long-lived is proved by the fact that many of them are found without teeth. Polybius, the companion of Emilianus, tells us that when they become aged, they will attack men, as they have no longer sufficient strength for the pursuit of wild beasts. It is then that they lay siege to the cities of Africa, and for this reason it was that he, as well as Scipio, had seen some of them hung up on a cross. It being supposed that others, through dread of a similar punishment, might be deterred from committing the like outrages. This observation is one commonly seen in modern-day India and sometimes Africa. Often old and injured big cats turn to hunting humans when they can no longer hunt their natural prey. It is fascinating that a similar problem was common around 2,000 years ago. Even then it appears that lions didn't prefer humans. I guess we taste bad. I also find it quite funny in a morbid way that they hung up lions on a cross to ward off others. A chapter later, Pliny mentions the character of the lion. He writes, the lion is the only one of the wild beasts that shows mercy to the suppliant. After it has conquered, it will spare, and when enraged it will vent its fury rather upon men than women, and never upon children, unless when greatly pressed by hunger. It is believed in Libya that it fully understands the entreaties which are addressed to it. At all events, I have heard it asserted as a fact 
that a female slave who was returning from Gaetulia was attacked by a number of lions in a forest, upon which she summoned sufficient strength to address them and said that she was a woman, a fugitive, helpless creature, that she implored the compassion of the most generous of animals, the one that has the command of all others, and that she was a prey unworthy of their high repute. Regardless if any of what Pliny said is based in reality, it does tell us something about how lions were viewed by the people of the time. They were often seen as noble animals of great strength and respect, a view that has not changed all that much today. In the same chapter, he generally describes how lions react to being hunted. When in pursuit, the lion advances with a leap, but he does not do so when in flight. When wounded, he discovers with wonderful sagacity the person who struck the blow, and will find them out however great may have been the multitude of his pursuers. If a person has thrown a dart at him but has failed to inflict a wound, the animal seizes him, whirls him round, and throws him to the ground, but without wounding him. Again, regardless of the accuracy of these claims, lions are portrayed as virtuous and courageous animals. Pliny then goes on to mention two different stories of lions reaching out to humans for help. In one, a lion has an injured paw, and in the other, a mother's cub is stuck in a pit. Both of the lions are helped by humans and seem grateful for the action. In the next chapter, Pliny mentions that lions became prominent in gladiatorial games. Sometimes hundreds of lions were killed in a single event. The chapter after, he mentions how they were actually caught. It was formerly a very difficult matter to catch the lion, and it was mostly done by the means of pitfalls. In the reign, however, of Emperor Claudius, accident disclosed a method which appears almost disgraceful to the name of such an animal. A Gaetulian shepherd stopped a lion that was rushing furiously upon him by merely throwing his cloak over the animal a circumstance which afterwards afforded an exhibition in the arena of the circus. When the frantic fury of the animal was paralyzed in a manner almost incredible by a light covering being thrown over its head. So much so, that it was put into chains without the least resistance. We must conclude, therefore, that all its strength lies in its eyes. It remains unknown if this was actually a common way to catch a lion, but the account is interesting. Pliny has a lot to say about lions and other animals, but not as much in a predatory sense. Though I think it is important to briefly look into the use of predators at the Roman games. Wild animals of all kinds were brought to various Roman games. Lions, rhinos, tigers, crocodiles, elephants, leopards, etc. Generally, these animals were used to execute prisoners, to fight each other, or to be hunted. The Venatores were a special type of gladiator that would carry out these shows. They would often train animals to fight each other because many went by themselves. Often, animals were chained together to provoke a fight. Bears were matched with snakes, lions with crocodiles, and any other imaginable combination. The main job of the Venatores was to actually hunt these animals. They would throw spears and shoot arrows at the near helpless animals in artificial stages. The most dangerous of these hunts consisted of hunters with only light tunics and short spears. A surviving mosaic from the time even shows a man on stilts fighting off a leopard. However, these individuals had it good compared to the prisoners sentenced to damnatio ad bestias. Damnatio ad bestias was a form of Roman capital punishment in which prisoners were executed by animals. More respectable prisoners were given small spears to fight off the animals, while many were given nothing at all. And even if you somehow managed to kill a beast while naked with a spear, they would just release another one. The prospect of the execution was so grim that many ended their own life before entering the arena. I know I am not the only one who is incredibly morbidly curious about these games. Though gruesome and immoral, 
I would certainly watch a lion fight a bear or a man with only a spear fight a leopard. People sometimes ask me what era in history I would like to go back to if I had a time machine. I often say some time in prehistory so I could see humans in a natural state, but honestly now I think I would want to attend the over 100 days of inaugural games at the Flavian Amphitheater. Overall, the use of these animals at Roman games can tell us a lot about not only the Romans, but about the human perception of predators in general. The capture and use of these animals was symbolic of the emperor's dominion over the wild. But beyond that, it was the embodiment of our perceived victory over the natural world. The human ego loves to see itself as being the pinnacle being above all else. But ferocious beasts which can easily kill us can make us feel vulnerable. Killing, capturing, and using these animals was a way to satisfy morbid curiosity, boost our ego, and a propaganda machine for the emperor. Nonetheless, this perceived mastery of nature was only a facade, because no such thing really exists. Even almost 2,000 years after these Roman games, predation is still a worldwide phenomenon. So now we will be looking into more recent cases for which man found himself as prey. In recent times, many have forgotten how dangerous and mischievous a wolf can be. Though it is certainly important to restore the former habitat of the wolf, we should understand why we made such an effort to exterminate them in the first place. Wolf attacks have happened for thousands of years. Direct predation by wolves may have decreased as we adopted agriculture, but their attacks on cattle have often provoked conflicts. This conflict is one that has inspired much hatred towards wolves. But even predatory attacks on humans have happened on many occasions within the last few thousand years. Wolves, like any other predator, often target human children, which of course brings furious hate towards their kind. Even full-grown adults and multiple people are known to have been targeted. Wolves were especially hated throughout Europe. Unlike some other cultures, the wolf is not usually seen as virtuous or noble in European folklore. It is often seen as cunning, greedy, and destructive. One account from the year 1439 can give us an idea about the thoughts regarding wolves. During the harsh winter of that year, a starving pack of wolves began targeting people in the city of Paris. The large pack was led by a distinctive red-furred wolf that was given the name Cortad. One day the pack entered the Notre Dame Square and killed a group of 40 clergymen. Later the pack was ambushed and every wolf was killed by arrows, spears, and rocks. These wolves were not acting normally, but either way their actions were treacherous. French wolves in particular seem to have been quite a threat to humans. France did have one of Europe's largest wolf populations between 10 and 15,000 but the rate of attacks was still high throughout the Middle Ages and even up until the 19th century. Through a rigorous examination of French sources, a team of researchers determined that there have been 5,400 victims of wolf attacks since the 12th century. Half of these wolves were rabid and many of the victims were children. Non-rabid wolves rarely attacked more than one person at a time, while rabid wolves were known to attack between one and several dozen victims. These victims often did not succumb to the rabies virus for up to a year after the attack. Here is some data on the frequency of attacks between 1570 and 1890. I know it is hard to read, so I linked the source in the description. Anyways. From this data we can tell that wolves were a serious problem for the people of France in these centuries. Some years they only killed less than five people, but other years they killed over a hundred. But to understand the severity of these attacks, we mustn't just look at mindless statistics. Each one of these people had a story, a family, and were part of their community. Their gruesome death or wound at the jaws of a beast was not only physically but psychologically devastating. 
One account from October 8, 1749 reads as follows. Marie, aged approximately seven years, daughter of Jacques Prudent and his wife, Tignette Maroyer, was snatched from her doorway by a wolf and devoured in a field. Only her head, one arm, and her stomach were found, and nothing besides. These pitiful remains were buried in the cemetery of this church the following day, 5th October before the entire parish who had gathered for Sunday Mass. People in modern times often side with animals for environmentally cautious reasons, but you must understand that the hatred for these animals was very just. The fear of the French people would come to a boiling point 15 years later when a beast began a rampage. Starting in the summer of 1764, a young woman was tending cattle in the province of Jovedon when a beast attempted to attack her. Luckily, her cattle protected her and warded off the predator. Her survival allowed her to be the first witness of the beast of Javadon. She described the beast as, like a wolf, yet not a wolf. Shortly after this incident, a 14-year-old girl was found savagely murdered with her heart ripped out of her body. Over the next few months, several attacks would occur, mostly on lone men, women, and children. The few survivors and witnesses of these attacks described the beast in a variety of ways. It was said to be a large dog-like creature with its hind legs longer than its front. It had a rusty brown coat with a stripe across its back and a long, thin tail. When it attacked, it aimed for the throat and tore its victims apart in a bloodthirsty rage. Attacks became so numerous that it was suspected there may be multiple beasts or that the beast was working together with others. In 1765, the beast attacked a group of seven children ranging from the ages of 8 to 12. They stuck together and were able to drive off the animal. The story made it all the way back to King Louis XV who awarded the kids money and decided to have the beast hunted down. A military and volunteer effort spent months attempting to kill the beast. Whenever they tracked it down, they would either miss their target or the beast would simply take the shot seemingly without damage. Two highly trained wolf hunters with eight bloodhounds were eventually sent to the cause. They were successful in killing a number of Eurasian wolves, but the attacks continued and they knew their job was not done. Eventually a third man, Francois Antony, the king's lieutenant of the hunt, was sent to kill the beast. In September of that year, he was able to kill an abnormally large gray wolf for which he thought was the beast. Though two months later, two boys were attacked suggesting the beast was still alive. The following June, a man named Jean Castel shot a large wolf which he claimed to be the animal responsible. A post-mortem examination did show that the animal had the remains of the last victim inside. After the death of this animal, no more attacks are attributed to the beast of Javadan. What this beast actually was, or if it was solely responsible for the deaths of over a hundred people, remains unknown. The undeniable fact of the story is that there was an animal, or animals, that killed over a hundred people in the small province of Javadan within a two to three year period. Many modern scholars believe that the hysteria associated with the frequent attacks inspired many exaggerated or fully fabricated descriptions of the animal. Most peculiar was its reddish brown color, use of claws, leaping motions, and long thin tail. All of these traits support the idea that the beast may have been a lion that escaped from a menagerie. Other aspects about how this beast hunted and preyed upon its victims do line up with this idea. Others have suggested that the beast may have been an escaped hyena, a wolf-dog hybrid, or even a large mastiff trained to kill. The animal may have just been a strange wolf or the victim of the human imagination. In actuality, there was likely not one single beast causing the deaths, but possibly several man-eating wolves. Statistically, the Javadan affair was not much worse than the other clusters of attacks from the time period. 
considering that many wolves in the region were tracked down and the attacks did stop. It is likely that Jean Jastel did not kill the Beast of Javudan, but killed the last Beast of Javudan. It is also possible there was a rogue hyena, lion, or mastiff terrorizing the province as well, but I think that it is much more likely that the wolves were the sole culprit and the human imagination did the rest. Either way, this example is important because it shows that embedded deep within our consciousness is a fear as old as man. A fear of what goes bump in the night and what lurks just beyond what the eye can see. Though we like to see ourselves as rational creatures, our minds cannot help but imagine the supernatural. Wolves were eventually eradicated by means of poison and hunting in France, a situation that would play out through much of the world. Wolf attacks still occur in many places today, but most of them are from rabid wolves. 489 attacks have occurred since 2002, but only 13% of them were predatory in nature. It is great that wolves are making a comeback in places, but let's not forget the power of their nature. Next, we will once again be talking about big cats, because after all, they are one of our greatest predators. These examples are much more recent, and in turn, a fair bit more accurate. The first example is about the Savo man-eaters. In March of 1898, the British started building a railway over the Savo River in Kenya. Thousands of Indian workers were employed in several camps over an area of 8 miles or 13 kilometers. During the first nine months of construction, two maneless lions stalked and killed the workers at night. Many were dragged out of their tents and devoured. The lions abruptly stopped the attacks for several months, but reports of lion attacks at a nearby settlement left many in fear. The two lions eventually did return and began killing daily. The crews were unarmed but attempted to prevent the lions with thorn fences and bright campfires. The lions simply jumped over the fences and killed their prey. The killings got so bad that hundreds of workers fled and even the district officer barely survived a lion attack. Eventually, John Henry Patterson was able to kill both of the lions. They proved to be incredibly hard to track down and also to kill. Both of them took several shots from high-power rifles. When it was all said and done, Patterson claimed that the lions had killed 135 victims. Modern scholars claim a more realistic number of around 30, though they admit there may have been more. The lions in question may have been driven to hunt men because of a plague that devastated their usual prey in the area. One of the lions also had a tooth infection which may have made hunting regular prey difficult. It is also possible that they got a taste for human flesh when bodies were dumped along slave trading routes in the area. Overall. This case is terrifying. The efficiency of big cats to kill us can possibly give us a hint to what our ancestors must have gone through. Possibly the most devastating man-eating big cats come from the country of India. Tigers in India generally do not like to eat humans. Attacks usually occur when humans approach a sleeping or feeding tiger. Other cases are thought to be of mistaken identity. Humans are sometimes attacked when bending over or moving fast on motorbikes. Some tigers do intentionally seek out humans as prey, but typically only when they are unable to hunt their natural prey. Certain injuries such as gunshot wounds, porcupine quills, missing or worn teeth, and a variety of health issues can lead to a tiger becoming a man-eater. Some man-eaters can go on to kill numerous people. The Champawat tiger was a man-eating tigress who killed up to 436 people. 200 men, women, and children were killed in Nepal before the predator was forced out. It continued its killing spree in India where it killed 236 more people before finally being killed. A British hunter killed the beast and found that it was missing both of the canines on the right side of its mouth. 
This injury prevented it from hunting its natural prey and in turn made her a man-eater. I almost feel bad for the old gal, but 436 people is 436 too many. This tiger is one of the many man-eaters, but certainly killed the most humans of any known predator. Though one animal does come close. The Pinar man-eater was a leopard responsible for the death of 400 people in India. Another leopard from the same region was responsible for the deaths of 125 people. This leopard known as the Rudraprayag man-eater once broke into a pen holding 40 goats. Instead of killing one of them, he decided to go for the sleeping 14-year-old boy assigned to guard them. There is no doubt that these man-eaters saw people as their main form of prey either from when they were young or from after they received crippling injuries. Kenneth Anderson was an Indian hunter and writer who actually hunted some of these beasts. Anderson once commented on man-eaters by saying, It is extraordinarily how very cautious every man-eater becomes by practice. Whether a tiger or panther and cowardly too, invariably it will only attack a solitary person, and that too after a prolonged and painstaking stalking. Having assured itself that no other human being is in the immediate vicinity, these animals seem to possess an astute sixth sense and are able to differentiate between an unarmed human being and an armed man deliberately pursuing them. For in most cases, only when cornered will they venture to attack the latter, while they go out of their way to stalk and attack the unarmed man. Big cats are certainly some of the most efficient hominin killers. Now let's move on to another great enemy of ours from prehistory, bears. Bears do not often hunt humans in a predatory sense. Bear attacks typically occur when bears are surprised, they're feeding, or they're around their cubs. Still, bears are wild animals, and many of you may know that polar bears do actually actively hunt people. Bear attacks are well documented throughout history, but I will mention a few notable ones. The Sankabetsu brown bear incident was the worst bear attack in Japanese history. In 1915, a bear in Japan went on a killing spree. It entered the home of two people and slaughtered them. A little over a week later, after surviving an encounter with a hunting party, it climbed through a window of another home. Here it killed multiple children and a pregnant woman. Hunters eventually made it to the residence, but the bear was able to escape once again. The Hokkaido government office then sent out a team of snipers to kill it. For the first few days, they were unsuccessful in luring the bear out of the woods. Eventually, a man shot at the silhouette of an animal, but he was unsure if it was actually the bear. The next morning, a blood trail was found and they were able to track down the animal resting by a tree. The bear was promptly shot in the head and heart which killed the animal. The bear turned out to be 340 kilograms or 749 pounds and stood 2.7 meters or 8.8 .8 feet tall. That is large for most bears, but especially large for a bear in Japan. The bear had killed seven people, injured others, and ransacked many houses. It was smart enough to avoid capture for some time, and its killing of humans was unusual. The second example of a bear attack we will be looking at is from the sloth bear of Mysore. Sloth bears are a species of bear that typically feeds on fruits, ants, and termites. They are not that large compared to other bears and rarely exceed 145 kilograms or 320 pounds. In 1957, a sloth bear in the Mysore state of India became unusually aggressive. It was originally passive and would simply forage in the fields of a village. Eventually it became very aggressive and began attacking people. In these attacks, it would target the face of its victims with its claws and teeth. Some victims had their faces ripped apart but survived the attack. Others were mauled to death and partially eaten. 
After over a dozen attacks, word got to our good friend Kenneth Anderson that the man-eating bear was on the loose. He came to hunt the bear but was unsuccessful in his first two hunts. Finally, on the third hunt after the bear had mauled more people, he was able to shoot it square in the chest, killing it. When it was all said and done, the sloth bear of Mysore had killed 12 people and severely injured two dozen others. The bear was acting out of character with no clear evidence why. But at the end of the day, they are still wild animals capable of anything. And that brings us to our next point. Wild bears are not our friends. Two men in the early 2000s thought otherwise. Both Timothy Treadwell and Vitaly Nikola Anko were self-educated bear experts. They studied their behavior and never in their wildest dreams would have been eaten by a bear. Though these men did not know of each other, they both met the same fate in the year 2003. Timothy and his girlfriend were both killed and almost entirely eaten by a 28-year-old bear. Since Treadwell was also a documentary filmmaker, he captured his and his girlfriend's demise on film. Just two months later, Vitaly was killed by a bear when apparently approaching one from three meters away to take pictures. He tried to defend himself with pepper spray and a flare gun, but both were obviously unsuccessful. Well guys, bears are not our friends. Even ones raised in captivity are known to kill people. Next, we will be talking about sharks. As we all know, sharks are terrifying. There's something about already being vulnerable in the water and knowing that there are monsters in it that make me fairly afraid of the ocean. And for some, they certainly have reason to be afraid. There are around 73 shark attacks a year, though typically less than 10 are fatal. That is really not a lot considering how many humans go in the ocean per year. But in 1916, between July 1st and July 12th, four people were killed and one injured on the Jersey Shore. The shark species and individuals were never found, but this event had an enormous effect on the public perception of sharks. Before, no one really cared about the animals, but now they were heavily demonized in American culture. This event inspired the movie Jaws and led to many sharks being targeted. Though this event was deadly, it was certainly overblown. An event which was much more terrifying was the sinking of the USS Indianapolis. The USS Indianapolis was a heavy cruiser that saw much use in the Pacific War. In 1945, it delivered the little boy atomic bomb to the island of Tinian to be dropped on Japan, after which it headed to the Philippines for training exercises. On its way, a Japanese submarine torpedoed the ship, sinking it in only 12 minutes. Of the 1195 crew on board, 300 went down with the ship. The remaining 895 faced exposure, dehydration, and shark attacks. Originally the sharks were only eating the dead, but soon they began attacking the wounded and eventually just anyone. Edgar Hall, who was 20 at the time, had this to say about the incident. All we heard was men being eaten alive, every day, every night. You would hear a blood-curdling scream and look and see someone going under. Eventually, after five whole days, the men were spotted in the water by a plane and rescued. Only 316 of the men survived, and it is thought that around 150 were killed by sharks. This is by far the deadliest shark attack ever recorded. One can only imagine the physical and psychological torture of spending five days floating in water as sharks pick off your friends. Sharks as a whole are typically not that dangerous, but they have gotten a bad rap from only a few incidents. Crocodiles, on the other hand, deserve to be seen as extremely dangerous. About 1,000 people a year are killed by crocodiles, though the number may be greater since many attacks occur in isolated villages. Every year, hundreds of Nile crocodile attacks occur in Africa, and saltwater crocs are also known to kill many throughout Southeast Asia and Oceania. Other crocodiles from around the world are known to attack humans, but none like the salt or Nile crocs. 
A 16-foot or nearly 5-meter croc named Osama terrorized a local village in Uganda for years. The animal killed over 80 people, which was 10% of the village's population. He would snatch people up from the edges of a lake and even grabbed a man right out of a boat. The people of the village believed that he was a mortal and an incarnation of Satan. The beast was eventually captured and sent to a breeding program to make handbags. Another notorious man-eater was Gustave the Crocodile. He has never been caught and over 300 deaths have been attributed to him, though the accuracy of these claims is in question. He has been estimated to be as much as 18 feet or 5.5 meters long and weigh 2,000 pounds or 910 kilograms. He is likely around 60 years old and still growing. His large size may have caused him to turn to humans as prey. Even after attempts, he has not been captured and a 2019 source claims that he was actually killed. Crocodiles are terrifying and it is really unfortunate that so many live in fear of their attacks. Well, this video has gone on way longer than I expected and I think I'm going to end it there. There are of course many more examples of humans being predated on by all sorts of animals but this video was mainly to cover historical accounts and animals that were on killing sprees. Regardless, I hope you enjoyed this video and make sure to stay safe in the wilderness. As I mentioned in the last video, I was on the same trail on the same day that a man was attacked and killed by a grizzly bear, all while having no form of protection besides three other people with me. Predators are real and if you find yourself around them, stay protected in some way. Thanks for watching and I'll see you on the next episode of North 2 Arrivederci.